Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Etta James was a gospel prodigy. She began her long career as a singer early, singing doo-wop as a teenager in the 1950s. Etta has enjoyed equal success crooning blues ballads, belting out rhythm and blues and rock and roll, or interpreting jazz. While the ease with which she can navigate these various styles demonstrates her impressive skill, it has also served to confound the music industry as to how to categorise her. In the late 20th century and into the next, James has finally been widely acknowledged as one of the most talented singers of her era. Why was Etta James punched in her chest by a priest? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Etta James, whose powerful, versatile and emotionally direct voice could enliven the raunchiest blues as well as the subtlest love songs, most indelibly in her signature hit, At Last. James was not easy to pigeonhole. She is most often referred to as a rhythm and blues singer, and that is how she made her name in the 1950s. She was also comfortable and convincing singing pop standards. Etta James is one of the most woefully overlooked figures in the history of blues and rock. She was never granted due credit for influencing tremendously popular acts like the Rolling Stones, Rod Stewart, Dinah Ross, Janis Joplin and an entire generation of musicians who have lauded her as a bridge between rhythm and blues and rock and roll. Recording some of the first ever rock and roll records as a teenager in the 1950s, James had a unique bird's eye view of rock's origins. Not limiting herself to rock, however, she went on to make potent soul records in the 60s and 70s, adding further polish to a career that has spanned nearly four decades. James has performed for black audiences in the South, blues fans in the North, rock fans on both coasts, and even opened tours for the Rolling Stones. Her booming mid-range and throaty low register, both powerful enough to shake you out of your seat, are her trademarks. The powerhouse singer, known as Miss Peaches, lived an eventful life. She first hit the charts as a teenager, taking the Wallflower, Roll With Me Henry, an answer record to Hank Ballard's Work With Me Annie, to number one on the R&B charts in 1955. She joined Chess Records in 1960 and had a string of R&B and pop hits, many with lush string arrangements. After a mid-decade fade, she re-emerged in 1967 with a more hard-edged, soulful sound. Regardless of how she was categorised, she was admired. Expressing a common sentiment, John Pearless of the New York Times wrote in 1990 that she had one of the great voices in American popular music, with a huge range, a multiplicity of tones and vast reserves of volume. For all her accomplishments, James had an up-and-down career, partly because of changing audience tastes, but largely because of drug problems. She developed a heroin habit in the 1960s. After she overcame it in the 1970s, she began using cocaine. She candidly described her struggles with addiction and her many trips to rehab. Throughout her career, James overcame a heroin addiction, opened for the Rolling Stones, won six Grammys, and was voted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Despite her ups and downs, including a number of health problems, she maintained an optimistic attitude. Most of the songs I sing, they have that blue feeling to it. They have that sorry feeling, and I don't know what I'm sorry about. I don't. Through it all, she was a spitfire beloved by contemporaries and young up-and-comers. If Etta James's life had not been weighed down with personal problems, mostly bad management, ghastly lovers, obesity, incarceration and addiction, she would have been acclaimed as a remarkable female soul singer alongside Aretha Franklin, Nina Simone and Tina Turner. Her fans know how good she is, but the general public in the world only know her for her top ten single, The Gritty and Sensuous, I Just Want to Make Love to You, recorded in 1960, but a hit through a TV ad in 1996. Her birth name was James Etta Hawkins, and she was born to a 14-year-old single mother named Dorothy Hawkins on 25th of January 1938 in Los Angeles, California. She never knew the identity of her father. 
It was possibly Italian, but James was convinced it was the pool player Minnesota Fats, as she possessed many of his characteristics. The mixed parentage contributed to her distinctive looks. She was light-skinned with almond-shaped eyes, a turned-up nose and natural red hair. Dorothy encouraged her daughter's musical talent. My mother always told me even if a song has been done a thousand times, you can still bring something of your own to it. I'd like to think I did that. James's childhood wasn't perfect. Her mother had brief relationships with various men, so Etta was raised by a series of foster parents. She was raised by two friends of Dorothy's, Lulu and James Rogers. She received vocal training early and became a gospel prodigy. She was known for having a big voice that didn't seem to fit her five-foot-three frame. The young child sang in St Paul's Baptist Church, where the choir master would punch her in the chest to make her sing from the gut. This unconventional and highly suspect method resulted in her developing a huge voice, especially for a child. However, James Rogers had an argument with the pastor and they moved to another church. By way of protest, she refused to sing and instead played bass fiddle in the school orchestra. Lulu Rogers died in 1950 and at age 12, Etta moved north to San Francisco. She became a delinquent, drinking hard and ignoring school. She formed a trio and was soon working for band leader Johnny Otis. We were up in San Francisco, Otis recalled, for a date at the Fillmore. That was when it was black. I was asleep in my hotel room when... My manager phoned. He was in a restaurant and a little girl was bugging him. She wanted to sing for me. I told him to have her come around to the Fillmore that night. But she grabbed the phone from him and shouted that she wanted to sing for me now. I told her that I was in bed, and she said she was coming over anyway. Well, she showed up with two other little girls, and when I heard her, I jumped out of bed and began getting dressed. We went looking for her mother since she was a minor. I brought her to L.A., where she lived in my home like a daughter. Despite her determination to audition for Otis in his hotel room, James remarked later, I was so bashful, I wouldn't come out of the bathroom. Otis suggested that she reversed her first name, becoming Etta James, and he gave her the sobriquet Miss Peaches. She began working for him, and four years later they recorded the song The Wallflower together. James lived with Otis's family and was paid $10 a performance. Although Otis took most of her earnings, $14,000 from writing royalties for Dance With Me Henry, was held in trust until she was 21. Her only other hit on modern was Good Rockin' Daddy, also in 1955, and a song that refers, way before time, to dancing the crazy twist, although this was really sexual innuendo. James's many singles for Modern demonstrate her versatility and used top New Orleans musicians, including Alan Toussaint. She recorded an answer version to Muddy Waters' I'm a Man, W-O-M-A-N, Woman. She sang gospel with sister Rosetta Tharp's Strange Things Happening and recorded the playful The Pickup, which features a saucy conversation with Harold Baptiste's tenor sax. The songs became pop smashes. Although she collected a share of the royalties, James was outraged to see another singer get most of the glory for her song. James, Otis and Ballard split the royalties three ways. That's one time when we were not unhappy with a white cover of a song originally recorded by a black performer, Otis said. She spent the next few years travelling the country at the bottom end of bills that featured stars like Little Richard, Bo Diddley and Zydeco King Clifton Chenier. Though she was still a minor, James grew up on these tours, meeting celebrities, witnessing their sometimes outrageous lifestyles and receiving treatment that ranged from adulation to racist intimidation to outright theft. Her star faded somewhat from her initial hits of 1955, but she was still performing in front of large and enthusiastic crowds during this period. As the 1950s drew to a close, James frequently found herself on the road and penniless. She began an association with Chicago's Chess Record Company in the late 1950s, recording several numbers on Chess's subsidiary label, Argo. In those early days, James, Gay, Curtis Mayfield and many other fledgling greats lived in Chicago's low-budget Sutherland Hotel. 
We were hungry, starving musicians, James revealed. During the early 1960s, James scored a string of major hits for chess and its subsidiary labels, making her one of the biggest stars on the R&B scene. In 1960, two James songs made the R&B charts. Four more reached the charts the following year, including the soulful ballad At Last, which peaked at number two. In 1962, James's Something's Got a Hold on Me reached the number four spot, the highest of her three hits that year. She also recorded several duets with Harvey Fuquois of the Moonglows, with whom her relationship was romantic as well as professional. But their relationship ended when Gwen took up with Fuquois, so the song predicted what would happen. It had a theme that was replayed in numerous James's records, her boyfriend with another woman. The material that James recorded for Chess exhibited the full range of her stylistic capabilities, from tender love ballads to heavy blues to easy on the ears pop. Although the people at Chess kept her career alive, they also exploited her, as they did many artists, finding ways to withhold royalties and grabbing the publishing rights to musicians' original material. Unfortunately, the pressures of constant touring wreaked havoc on her personal life. By the time she was 21 years old, James was addicted to heroin. Her problems with drugs made it all the more difficult for James to sustain her career. She also seemed drawn to violent and abusive men. By the mid-1960s, she had disappeared from the scene again. She rebounded in 1966 to record a widely acclaimed blues album, Call My Name. She also recorded a series of duets with singer Sugar Pie DeSanto, a childhood friend, and those sessions produced a big hit in In the Basement. Etta continued to work productively throughout the 1960s and 1970s, despite several career highs and lows. Her income came from live performance, and it hardly mattered that she was being cheated as her money went on drugs. In 1964, her manager, John Lewis, was sent to prison for pushing drugs, and James was jailed twice for passing bad checks. She realised that something was sadly wrong with her life when she was asked to give pleasure to an 80-year-old man in exchange for heroin. By the early 1970s, James's life was very much out of control, although she managed to arrive at the recording studio and at live performances when required. In order to support her growing heroin habit, she found it necessary to become a petty criminal, forging prescriptions and writing bad checks. When things got bad enough, she was not above stealing from friends and acquaintances. In 1973, faced with the prospect of several years in prison, James opted to enter the residential drug rehabilitation program at Tarzana Psychiatric Hospital outside of Los Angeles. In 1973, she earned a Grammy nomination for her album Etta James, which was a combination of rock and funk. She then signed with Warner Brothers Records and also performed at the opening of the 1984 Olympic ceremony in Los Angeles. Etta's career continued in the 1990s when she was well into her 50s. She went on tour where she was known for her energetic stage performances. In spite of her popularity, however, James was never able to break out of the black market in the 1960s. Ironically, her singing style of purring, pointing and little girl pouting was copied by Supreme Diana Ross, who was able to score hits in the white music market. Although James remained largely unknown outside of the black community, despite her hits, white rockers knew who she was. Many rock stars had become Etta James fans early on, and her no-holds-barred singing style influenced several of them. Janis Joplin and Rolling Stone Keith Richards were among those who were listening to James when she was still toiling on shoestring budget tours. James continued to record during her rehabilitation, producing two more albums in 1974. During the rest of the 1970s and into the early 1980s, she kept busy performing in small clubs and occasionally at big-time blues and jazz festivals, usually bringing the house down. Finally, free of her various addictions, James's career suddenly skyrocketed in the mid-1980s. After decades of failing to find a crossover audience, James's albums began to catch on with white listeners. As fans of her early work rose to positions of power in the entertainment industry, James's songs began to find their way into all sorts of unexpected places. 
James's demons caught up with her over the years, however. She piled on weight until she had difficulty walking. For years she was helped onto stage in a wheelchair for knee problems exacerbated by her weight. But when she fell on a New York City sidewalk and had trouble getting her nearly 400-pound body back up, James knew she needed help. She had gastric bypass surgery in 2002 and dropped approximately 200 pounds. As she entered her 70s, James began struggling with health issues. She was hospitalised in 2010 for a blood infection, along with other ailments. It was later revealed that the legendary singer suffered from dementia and was receiving treatment for leukaemia. Her medical problems came to light in court papers filed by her husband, Artis Mills. Mills sought to gain control over $1 million of James's money, but he was challenged by James's two sons, Donto and Sumeto. The two parties later worked out an agreement. James died at her home in Riverside, California on January 20, 2012. Today, she continues to be considered one of music's most dynamic singers. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Etta James? She would be remembered for her voice and music that transcended genres.